Welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. The crossroads where culture, lifestyle, and community meet. All hosted by the legendary New York radio TV personality and proud Harlem American, G. Keith Alexander. Thank you so very, very much. And uh, welcome to What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. And wherever you are, I appreciate you for joining our neighborhood as we hang out together in Harlem, America. Now today in the What's Hot Spotlight is Nima Barnett, prominent, innovative, and prolific director, writer, and producer. Nima has engaged audiences with a body of compelling socially and politically charged work that defies the narrow stereotypes of African-Americans usually depicted in entertainment for over 30 years. Nima's most recent television directing credits include Harlem, a new series for Amazon starring Whoopi Goldberg and Megan Good, and The Equalizer starring Queen Latifah for CBS. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure to say that Nima Barnett is what's hot. <laughs> Well, thank you, G. Keith. You're what's hot. Oh, my God. I'm honored. <laughs> I'm honored. I've been a fan for years, and I'm honored. Between you and there I go, there I go, Frankie oh. Crocker. That was all of my Harlem <laughs> youth days. This is you, you know? So uh, most of my memories are based on you and Frankie. So um, I'm, I was excited that you asked me, and I'm honored to be here. Well, that, that is so nice that you, you shared that. Uh, you are quite a force to be reckoned with and we love you for all the work that you've done and all the shows that we've seen that we didn't know you were directing unless we stayed to the end of the credits of course or 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 but you uh it, it's such an honor to have you here to take time out and uh i looked at your bio three pages of a bio okay now normally when folks send me their bio it's like, you know, maybe one and one and a half pages, you know, you got three pages of work. Uh, and so when I, and it, of course, the work, the, the bio came in like, uh, it was like uh, 10, uh, you know, it was so small, I could hardly read it. So mm -hmm. I had to blow it up to 14. And when mm -hmm. I blew up, when I blew the, the, uh, all the information up to 14, I must have about eight pages. Wow eight pages well, of your I've body been of work. A long time, GK. <laughs> yeah, so so we're going to talk about all of it. Uh and uh I I went to I, uh, IMDb and you got over 50 directing credits there. So we're we're going to talk about all of this, but first as I usually do, I usually ask my uh my special guest mm -hmm. to join me in the Wayback Machine. And let's take the Wayback Machine to the beginning of your early childhood career in Harlem, right? You were born in yeah. Harlem? Born and raised and still live here. Fantastic. So mm -hmm. so, so, take us back to the early days for you. Uh, how early do you want to go? <laughs> 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 I don't know how early you want to go, but um, I, I'll, I'll just abbreviate, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, born and raised in Harlem, you know, um, latchkey kid, Stayed at the library at five o'clock with my brother every day till my mother could pick us up. Uh, so I read a lot and I hung on the stoop with my girlfriends. So I was a street kid. I hung on the stoop. I played 45s and I read a lot. That's what I did in my youth. And then um, I got accepted to high school performing arts, the original one on 46th Street. Mm -hmm. So I went, took the D train down there every day. And that kind of gave me a different, unique perspective, you know, and then um on and on, you know, while I was in performing arts, one thing did happen. There was one black teacher in performing arts. Her name was Vinette Carroll. She was a director. Mm. She was from the islands and she directed, don't bother me, I can't cope on Broadway. You know, um, I'd never seen a woman director before and I'd ne never seen a black woman director before. And she was my teacher. And when I graduated, like Glenn Turman was ahead of me. Uh, Chip Fields was, uh, around in my area too, as well in performing arts. And so Vinette formed this group called it the uh, Urban Arts Corps. Mm -hmm. And she asked myself and Glenn and Melvin Johnson and Chip, all of us to be 
in that urban arts course. So we would go around in the summers while I was, I'm a graduate of City College. Um, <laughs> in the summers, we would go around to the prisons and various, you know, community organizations and we would do plays. And then I'm a hard you girl. My first job at 14 was from Harlem Youth Unlimited. And then I got a job in college in the summertime um, being drama and dance director. So what I did was I took the plays that I was doing with Vinette Carroll mm -hmm. and I would redirect them with the kids that I was working with at the oh, Harlem really? Y on 135th Street. And that's when I really fell in love with directing. And it was seeing, being in the presence of Vinette Carroll that made me, when I enjoyed direct, when I started doing it and I enjoyed it, it made me start to think that, you know what, I may be able to do this. And that's one of the main reasons I became a director. Well, because now, but someone who looked like me. Fantastic. Well, now you um, wanted to be an actor, though. Also, I was an actress. yes, I went to high school performing arts for acting. Um, at that time, there weren't too too many roles you could play a prostitute or a maid. Um, <laughs> in, I came up also in in theater in a time with people like Richard Wesley and Tsaki Shange, a lot of new and exciting young black playwrights who were writing different kinds of plays, which really excited me. And so um, I, 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 I drifted more toward directing because I could be in control. I could put, do a little bit of, put my two cents in the set design, the story, you know, uh, the, the acting, the, all the creative parts of it, the music, the pacing, everything. And I enjoyed that a lot better because I didn't want to play a prostitute and I didn't want to play a maid. So <laughs> the only thing left for me to do was um, do something else. And, that was, <laughs> and, that, and, that, and that's, that's what I started doing. And then when I graduated, <clears throat> they had Cliff Frazier and Ossie Davis had this mm -hmm. program called Third World Cinema, where they had, uh, would, you would join Third World Cinema and they would place you with people who were in the film business all over the city and you would get a little stipend you know, and maybe a job afterwards. So I got to, I joined Third World Cinema and they were like, well, you're too young, you should stay in acting. Directors are old, you know, blah, 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 blah. But I wanted to do it anyway. So I joined them and I started learning about film. And then Cliff Frazier did an after school special. Mm -hmm. um, and I was partly produ helping him produce it. And that after school special won an Emmy. So I won an Emmy and Cliff won an Emmy. <laughs> won an Emmy. It was really exciting, you know, and um, I made friends at Third World Cinema that I still have today. Mm -hmm. Preston Holmes, who became, you know, a big time producer, who did a lot of movies and stuff and some other people who came out of Third World Cinema. And you yourself came out of Community Film Workshop, which was, That's right. which was the mainstream for people of color getting into the television and radio business, period, right? That's and, right. And and, Carol Jenkins was in my uh, class as well. Okay, you see yeah. all of these people, Cliff, you know, Cliff and Ossie's programs, uh, they were, they're responsible for us getting in the business. That's right. And so, you know, and 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 people like you who are star, uh, and other people like <laughs> that, no, really a star, you know, what would, we, what would we have done without these programs? I don't know. Or like one of my best friends, Julie Dash, who did Doors of the Dust, she went to mm -hmm. the uh, Studio Museum. Mm -hmm. film community film workshop and she learned filmmaking there and look what she's been able to do you know so now i'm um the dwyer center as you know with Vosla and cliff uh i'm on the board of directors now and we made a lot of changes and we're getting ready to open back up with rafa kamal and you know some really good people on the board and and i feel blessed to have been a part to revitalize you know that type of thing and hopefully we'll be able to do more things like Community Film Workshop and Third World Center for the next generation, you know. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, then I went, got accepted to AFI. So I went from Harlem to Hollywood, mm -hmm. scared to death, uh, called up Gene Kersenberg and said, you know, the only people I know in Hollywood are out of work actors from my high school. So right. <laughs> affiliated with a New York school. She said, oh, no, no, Nima. The whole thing is you have to come to Hollywood. So I packed my bags and I went from Harlem to Hollywood. And Quite frankly, it changed my life, you know? So um, that's what happened to me and a lot in between. And a lot of in between. Well, um, just so folks who are listening, uh, who may have an interest in getting into the film or TV business, tell them where the, um, 
what what would be a good uh, entry point for them, and and where would they go? Would they go to the Dwyer Center or or well, the Dwyer is open yet? You know, for for they have. I think they just have to research it, G Keith. You know, there's a lot of programs. Uh, all of the networks have have programs now for people who young people who want to get into directing. You know. Um, a lot of them, I think that, you know, they need to do their own short film or something first to have something to show, which you could shoot a short film with your iPhone. So, you know, right. and edit it on, you know, movie, making movies or whatever that that the uh, app is. So well, they show sure know how to do that because they do it on TikTok and all these other that, that's apps it. and stuff, you know. That's it. So you need one of those. But, uh, you know, I felt fortunate to have gone through Third World Cinema because it was more like a family. And I was with my people and we were encouraged, black art was encouraged, mm -hmm, you know? And mm -hmm. I went out to Hollywood and I did, uh, finally got an episode after I did my AFI film of what's happening now. I remember all of these folks running on the stage saying, oh, Nima, we found out that there's never been a black woman who ever directed a sitcom before. I mean, Debbie Allen directed Fame, but that was like our, our film, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I don't know what they were expecting me to say, but I said, that's a shame. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm, I'm just glad that I broke that ceiling, you know, um, and I'm glad I had the training at Third World with my community and my people, because when I went out to Hollywood and then I got that three picture deal it was the first black woman to ever get a three picture deal at a major studio. My the types of films and scripts that I had, they weren't interested in doing, you know, my husband, and I wrote a script called a guide about our building in Harlem and they were like, where people owned our own apartments and they were like, that's nobody would believe that Nima. <laughs> that people don't own their own apartments. I'm like, okay, here we go. It was just a lot going on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not happening. But because I had such a strong social and political base from New York and from my community, you know, I was able to be proud of what I did do, not feel sorry for what I didn't accept. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. keep my head high and try to maintain my integrity, which I think is first and foremost for any artist, because once you sell out, I don't think that you could really find your art anymore, quite frankly. So, wow. uh, you know, a lot happened and um, I, well, I, what's happening now. And after that, I got some other jobs. Well, when you went out to Hollywood, you were about, what, 24 years old, 25? Uh, something? Yep, yep. And you got this three picture deal from Columbia Pictures. Correct. And it, it, what were the three pictures that you uh, signed up for? Well, we first were going to do, my husband was writing a script called The Guide. Like I told you, The Guide was a story about our building in Harlem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, everybody the building that you live in right now? The building I live in right now. <laughs> and it was about gentrification, you know, and how people mm -hmm. were trying to push the people out of the building so they could resell it for more money, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. we did that. And then we wrote a Western mm -hmm. called uh, uh, Bowley about, I don't know if you're familiar with Bowley, Oklahoma, or no. Black Town in Oklahoma. No. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we had that script and those two, and we were getting, we were, the guide was the first one that was ready to go. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for me, well, Frank Price gave me the first, David Putnam gave me my first deal. I had two deals. Mm -hmm. David Putnam did Chariots of Fire. And I had a movie that I was developing from a young adult black novel called Listen for the Fig Tree that won a junior Pulitzer Prize about a young black blind girl and her mother. And then he got kicked out. Okay, then I got another deal with Frank Price when he became president of, of uh, uh, Columbia and Sony. And mm -hmm. then he got kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> right before I was getting ready to do the guy, I was there with John Singleton. John did Boys in the Hood, right? Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to go next, but then Frank got kicked out. So my oh. mother, like, all right, so uh, that 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 happened, and um, it didn't work out for me, but it's working out for Issa and Ava, and you know all these other wonderful, particularly black women who are out there now, getting mm -hmm. deals and making movies. And I'm I'm overjoyed that I live to see this kind of progress. So, you know, being being a first is not easy, but it's rewarding if you see the result. If it feeds result that all the whelps on my back, GP, <laughs> we're not here, okay? <laughs> Just seeing young women like them being successful makes it all worthwhile. So they're, they're standing on your shoulders, actually. And, uh, but you were, the, you were the first to have a three-picture deal. You were the first woman to direct a sitcom. Yep. 
Yeah. The, I'm, I'm sorry. First black woman first black to do woman. all of these things. First black woman to, to get a three picture deal. First black woman to direct a sitcom. First black woman to do what else? What, what else have I missed? That's it so far. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it. That's it. That's those two. Those two things. That's it. And how many awards do you have? Wow. Okay. Well, I've been, I don't know. I've been blessed. I, I, um, I have an Emmy. I have Image Awards. I have a De Delta Lily Award, you know, from a piece I did called Zora Is My Name, starring Ruby D and, and um, uh, Ruby D, Lynn Whitfield, um, Oscar Brown Jr., who's mm. for BS. And the Deltas gave me their Lily Award for that. I have quite a few. I don't, you know, I can go into them, but I've been fortunate, particularly the, you know, film festivals, American Black Film Festival, we won Urban World Film Festival, mm -hmm. AFI Film Festivals with mm -hmm. my civil brand. Um, we won a nomination for Best Independent Feature for a movie I did with Bishop Jakes called Woman Thou Loose on the Seventh Day, starring Blair Underwood and Pam Greer. And a lot of other awards from Real Sisters of Diaspora, um, the Black Shorts with Sandra Me 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 Meggers, Manley, you know, Megger Evers relative has a great festival in Los Angeles every year gave me the Icon Award. I've won the Bronze Lens Award in Atlanta. See, uh, <laughs> I told you. I've been going on and on, but- um, I told you, I had, I had three pages of your <laughs> uh, bio. I'm telling you, incredible, the, the work that you've done. Well, look, we, we've got a, a couple of minutes before we go to break, okay. and uh, we'll be right back with the uh, 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 some more of your uh, legacy and, and uh, that we want to hear some more about uh, some of the shows that you've done. But I just want to remind everyone right now that uh, HarlemAmerica.com is a total Black experience in entertainment, empowerment, and health and wellness. And on the site, you can find What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander podcasts. And where we also have some on-demand TV shows there as well, uh, of which uh, this will be one of them coming up after uh, a few weeks. So anyway, thank you all for uh, being with us right now. We're with uh, TV and film director, Ms. Nima Barnett, and we're gonna have more when we come back. Don't go away. Oh, thank you so very, very much, Kevin Bernay there. She's a wonderful, uh, voice uh, artist as well as singer. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that Harlem America is connecting Harlem with the Harlems of the world with enlightening and engaging articles for and about our culture. You can find them on our website, harlemamerica.com as well. But right now you can find on What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander, the legendary Nima Barnett. And uh, Nima, so let's talk about... Um, you did Luke Cage in Harlem. Yes. And how was that for you? What was that like working in our community? It was fantastic. I was home. You know, I, I also, before Luke Cage, I did this show called The Breaks. That's mm. an executive producer who's a, a brother, very talented filmmaker. We shot that in New York. That was about hip hop in the 90s. And I shot that in Harlem. A lot of scenes in Harlem. I pushed the location scouts. I said, listen, why well, deal with this downtown crap? Let's go uptown to my neighborhood <laughs> and shoot the camp, you know. So it started with that, you know. And in Luke Cage, um, there, there were several Harlem locations. It was a joy, you know, because it's a place I know. I grew up on I could walk blindfolded, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and it felt good to have these companies patronize Black-owned businesses. You know, everybody has their people that they go to, the location scouts, you know, they have their contacts. And, you know, to shoot in a brownstone in Harlem, I think it needs to be a black owned brownstone. Okay, because we need those, that opportunity for to use our homes and businesses as locations as well. So mm -hmm. that I'm definitely able to do and push and have gotten done. You know, um, working with Mike as Luke Cage was fantastic. Uh, working with Coca, the creator was fantastic. You know, he's the nephew of Richard Wesley. You know, Richard Wesley. Oh, yes. Richard, yeah. Richard's um, a, a prolific writer. Yes, he is. And I directed his the original Talented Ted at the Manhattan Theater Club. I directed it in workshop and off Broadway, Richard mm -hmm. Wesley's play. So the, to get to work with his nephew who created uh, Luke Cage and work with Alfre 
and all these talented, you know, black actors was uh, was a joy for me. You know, I was honored to do it, and it came out very well. So, anytime I'm able to work in New York, it's a pleasure. You know, I did Blind Spot in New York as well. Blind Spot I, was one of my favorite shows. Well, I couldn't get them to go to Harlem, but I did get them to go to the South Bronx. <laughs> it was a Latino storyline in there, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and also, I got them instead of hiring a white actor to play a lawyer. I said, you ever heard, or you ever thought about hiring a woman? What about someone like Gloria Rubin? Not mm. only did they hire Gloria Rubin, but they made her reoccurring. So, you know, these are things that in TV, you know, it's basically a producer's medium, but there are things that you can do as a director that you could bring up. You know, when I did The Equalizer, uh, it was a special episode about immigration. And I was very strong in stating my opinion that that Latina needed to be an Afro-Latina of brown complexion. I saw the show last Sunday. Oh, you did, yeah. Yes, so, Gr um, great show. Thank you, you know, Queen was in my corner with that. Uh, the, the, the showrunners, not so much, but that's okay. We, we, we fought, we fought, and we got what we got. You know, it wasn't <laughs> what we all want, really wanted in the, in the bottom line, but, but we got enough, you know? And so it's always a teaching process, particularly when you have Oh, uh, you don't have third world people at the top mm -hmm. in charge of a third world storyline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's a matter of coming in and, you know, recoding the mm -hmm. old stereotype and decoding it with some kind of our own reality, you know. And so we had, I had to fight for that, but I got, you know, I got, I, I won some battles and that was good. Uh, just to say that even in, in a hit show like The Equalizer, there's always something, <laughs> you know. But let me tell you, Queen Latifah is a warrior, and she's so fantastic and fabulous. And uh, I was honored to work with her. You know, ladies first. I told ladies you, first. first changed my life. You know, so uh, we had a great. I had a great time working with her, and I was. I didn't mind going to battle, because, it was worth it. You know, mm -hmm. you have to pick and pick your battles, you know. Um, but that was a battle that I wanted to fight and I'm glad that we did it. So, and I'm glad that people seem to like that episode and I'm, I'm glad, but you know. It was really a really, really a nice episode, uh, you know, uh, but, but, but let me ask you this though. <clears throat> okay, so being the director on the episode, do you change or do you alter someone's acting slightly yes. or, 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 or do you really overtly change how they perform? Well, I think, you know, an episodic, unless you do the pilot, uh, the characters are pretty much drawn, but mm -hmm. I definitely direct the actors. That's, I'm an actor's director. You know, I, I give the actors direction. Actors can't see themselves, you know, and every story is different. And when you're, when you're doing an episodic, some people can get into a rut. You know, it's not that they don't have the talent, but they just like, you know, I want to get out early. You know, they're not asked to be creative. They're not asked to have the creative input. And so mm -hmm. when you're not asked to have creative input, after a while you get bored. So you have to come in as a director and regenerate that excitement, you know, and, and, and give people opportunity to be involved in the process, you know, the actors to be involved in the process. And that generates better performances. Are you a, um, I mean, do you direct in a how gentle way or, or, <laughs> or, 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 or do you sometimes get aggravated and, 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 and have to uh, be a little more forceful in I, your I did, direction? I'll give you two, you two examples. GK. Okay. One, I was directing, I directed the Cosby show too, but I also directed the Cosby Mysteries, which was an hour show. I remember that. Detective. And I did a special episode that wound up winning a Peabody Award where Clarence Williams, mm -hmm. uh, who was a fantastic actor, played a jazz musician mm -hmm. whose son got killed while his friend was playing with his brother's gun. Okay. So we were uh, shooting a scene at the bottom line. And, and Clarence Williams, who's phenomenal, you know, uh, did the scene. And uh, I thought I had an idea. And so I said, Clarence, you know, what, 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 what is it, Nima? You're not getting what you want? You want something different? I said, no, no, no. I said, you know, I was just thinking and I went over and I told them, but I was scared to death, but I, I, I remembered and I believe strongly that everybody needs direction. And if you don't give the actor direction, then when they see it, they're gonna be more mad at you. 
<laughs> when I did Zora is my name and Lou mm-hmm. Gossett uh, was first time I worked with Lou. I also worked with him on a movie called Run for the Dream, the Gail Divas story. You know, Gail mm-hmm. Divas, Olympic champion. Right. In, in later years, but I was a kid when I did Zora is my name. And I remember him playing a preacher. And of course, he was from the Iowa, all, all star cast. I mean, I, I was in a dream world, Bea Richards, you know, everybody. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he, I said to him, you know, I, met, I said, you know, Mr. God said, you know, when the ministers get or, or leave the pulpit and they start, go, I, I got you, name, I got you, I know what you got, I got you. <laughs> I was like, oh God. And he did it, you know, he did mm-hmm. it. But I was like, oh God, so he's going to shoot. I mean, how do you give Lou Gossett a, a, a direction, you know? But you have to take a deep breath and mm-hmm. you have to, what is a director, you know, G. Keith, without their opinion? And That's later right. years, I got a call to do the Gail Diva story of which Lou played Bob Kersey and of which he was one of the executive producers. And he said, I never forgot you. And he's got the nerve to give me that kind of direction. And <laughs> the Gail Diva story. So, um, you know, from those two experiences, I learned, or like when I, when the Red Fox uh, and Della Reese had a brief show, remember? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. A while, and so I think Red Fox had called Mr. Cosby and said, "You know, I'm having problems with these these white like, directors." And he said, "Well, I've got a young black woman here, and I'm going to send her out there to do an episode." So I get out there, and he looked. Red Fox looks at me, a legend, and he goes, "You're a director?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "How are you going to direct me?" <laughs> I'm going to direct you. I said, "I'm going to fill your glass with scotch and light up your cigarette and turn the camera on. That's all I'm going to do." <laughs> Because that, that's all you could do for Red Fox, right? <laughs> you know, you, you just got to let him go. You know what I mean? So um, I've been blessed, but I, I have learned that everybody could use a little help because the director is looking at the entire overall vision mm-hmm. you know, and the actors can't see themselves. Um, so I do give direction gently. I'm not, you know, I don't say keep your day job. You know what I mean? Um, I I try to pull people to the side and, and uh, try to find things. But coming from theater, my work ethic is read the scene first, talk about the scene, mm-hmm. you know, and I do my homework and I do an emotional beat sheet. I track the actor's emotion throughout the entire show. So, because, you know, things are shot out of sequence. Right. So everybody, including me, doesn't remember if you shot scene six last week and you're shooting scene uh, seven, eight days later, or oh, well, uh, what happened to scene six? <laughs> what kind of position was I in, Nima? You know, so all that helps. And TV is so fast. Movies is different. You know, you have time. But yeah. um, I've learned a lot. I learned a lot from, from some great, great actors. Even in Luke Cage, when I directed a scene with Alfre, it was the scene where her brownstone was burnt out. Mm-hmm. And she was coming in for the first time. And so I told her, I said, you know what we're going to do? And I told the cameraman, I said, I'm going to follow you, Alfie Handheld. And we're not going to, we're not going to rehearse it. We're just going to follow you around. She said, really? I said, really? And uh, needless to say, if you look at the episode and see the scene, it was phenomenal. You know, but everybody was panicking, like, no, oh, it looks like it's black and white. Oh, we're not going to have any coverage. Oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> but when you're working with, you know, a super talent like Alfie Woodard, a queen like Alfie, she deserves that freedom. Because whatever she's give, she gives you is going to be gold. You know oh, that. You know it. You yeah. know it. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, different methods for different situations. So the, the worst experience you've had as a director would be what? Ugh. I'd rather not say. <laughs> oh, it's that bad, huh? <laughs> That'll be in your book, uh, Called, be uh, my, that's definitely going to be in my book, G. Keith. That's going to be in my book. But, you know, a, my job is to get the job done, you know, and I'm a sensitive artist. If I lose my sensitivity, I lose my art. So mm-hmm. I have learned to take the hits, put my big girl panties on mm-hmm. and keep it moving to get to the finish line. You know, some situations are kinder than others, you know, and I mean, taking orders from a a woman and a black woman is not an easy pill for a lot of people to swallow, particularly in television when 90% of the crew wants to direct and you're there directing. So, you know, it's not always an easy situation, but, you know, I've worked with people like Mara Brock. I did uh, Be and Mary Jane. I did Black Lightning. 
I did mm -hmm. um, Love Is, and it was a joy working with Mara, a joy working with um, Will Packer. I did Ambitious, a joy working with uh, Ava, you know, and Queen Sugar, and mm -hmm. most recently Naomi, which is coming on next week. So I've had situations where, and working on Luke Cage and, Isha, and working with Seath, and um, working with Anthony Hemingway recently on Genius Aretha. You know, I did episodes two and three of that, that, you know, TV show based on Aretha Franklin that mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ron Howard and um, Brian Glazer did, put together, you know. Uh, but I had support from the cast and support from Anthony. You know, when you're working with people who are supportive, it's a whole different ball game. And you're fighting a system because that was not a series that was black run. You know what I mean? So we had battles, uh, but it's a new, but we stuck together and we fought mm -hmm. together and we watched out for each other. So for me, those experiences outweigh the bad ones. I got you. Well, okay. So now the, this new show that's on now that people are talking about called Harlem. Yes. Tell us, tell us about that show. That show is fantastic. It was created by Tracy Oliver who's such a gifted young black woman, she wrote Girls Trip. Mm -hmm. She created First Wives Club, which I think is on BET, you know, mm -hmm. remake of that as well. Um, Malcolm Lee called me, you know, Malcolm. And right. he- uh, was, I worked for Malcolm once. Okay. And he, I, I, I had to do overdubs for, uh, uh, what's the movie with uh, uh, Bernie Mac and, and Sam Jackson? soul the soul, soul man, man or something yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had to do some overdubs for bernie max uh role. okay well then malcolm has good taste if he picked you well thank you <laughs> but he called me and he was like there's a show and i'm doing the first two and i suggested if can you come in and do the finale you know because mm -hmm. he directed girls trip so he and tracy had a relationship mm -hmm. i said okay and i went in and um directed episodes nine and ten which was a finale and was mesmerized at how gifted Megan was. Oh my God. I mean, I knew she was talented and beautiful, but her range was outstanding. I was so, and so professional, all of them. They're all fabulous. The whole cast was, and of course the chance to work with Whoopi Goldberg, oh my God, uh, was an honor. And, you know, I just let her go and she was funny. And, and it was just, a, it was a joy, G. Keith. I knew it was gonna be a hit because Tracy is full of self-love for black women. Mm -hmm. And the show reflected self love. You know, it was a comedy. It had, you know, a lot of funny things in it, but also had some very serious issues about Black women's health and treatment in the hospital, you know, um, uh, uh, finding oneself and career changes and, you know, uh, uh, being an artist and, and, and taking the hits and trying to keep your head above water, all of that. But I, 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 I wanted to do, you know, I was also approached to do Run the World, the other show about Harlem which I turned down um, and Why? nothing against, well, the scripts weren't for me. I didn't think that it reflected my community. Mm -hmm. And um, the young woman who wrote it said that she moved into Harlem with her friends from graduate school. And this is what they experienced. But I thought that my community had a lot more, you know, nothing against it, you know, it just wasn't for me. But when I read the Harlem scripts, I said, I could do this, I could do this. And, you know, we were short on, on time and money, but we made it happen. I mean, I got to put a scene in, you know, that my girlfriend's nice to do after going to a party at Small's Paradise. We go to the bodega and get a sour pickle and some potato chips. And then we walk <laughs> down the street and we sit on the stoop, you know, at two o'clock in the morning and we talk about the party. So I got to put a couple of things, you know, like instead of Megan saying my neighborhood, she says mm -hmm. my block, you know. Um, and I got to put community people in my episode i got to put melba in for uh, melba. Every, everybody loves melba's restaurant everybody loves melba's restaurant like she said she's born bred and buttered in harlem that's, that's right. my harlem sister and she did a scene with whoopi goldberg and whoopi stretched it out you know and said melba this food was delicious you know? so <laughs> yeah working in the community with, in harlem and working with executives who listen mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, who are mm -hmm. interested in change and interested in balanced representation, it, it was just a joy. I I knew I knew G Keith it was going to be good, but I know it was going to be this much of it. <laughs> this this show has went zoop, you know, way up, way up, way up. It's a it's a huge hit, and I know why because it hits it it, it touches uh, a lot of subjects that you know black people 
that we go through and especially mm -hmm. young people go through when they're trying to develop their lives and, and, and figure out what they want to do with their lives, you know. But let me tell you, those girls are so talented and so professional and so on it. And Queen Megan Good, she killed it. I mean, I was just, I had my, I just pulled my mouth together because she was so talented, so funny, such perfect timing. You know, they all were, they all were fabulous. So kudos to Queen Tracy Oliver. I'm so happy for you and happy for the girls and hope, looking forward to a season two. I Fantastic. got to at the Schomburg. Oh, I changed great. locations and they wanted an art gallery. They were going to do new. I said, no, let's do it in Schaumburg. So we went to the Schaumburg and we got black artists and we put their artwork in the Schaumburg and we shot it. So yeah, it was, it was good. It was good to use uh, my community, you know? Well, uh, we, we're about 30 seconds out from another break, but we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk more about this. Uh, want to uh, let folks know that, uh, you know, why not let Harlem America help you build fame, fortune, and followers around your business or your brand uh, like Will Roundtree with his new talk show podcast on Harlem America called Full-Time CEO, the S-H-I-T They Won't Tell You. Let us produce your show and you talk about what you know on harlemamerica.com. We'll be right back with the legendary Nima Barnett. Well, thank you, G. Keith. You're legendary too, you know. <laughs> Hey, Kevin, you forgot to tell them that if they have Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Android TV, iPhone App Store, or the Google Play Store, that they can download the Harlem America TV streaming app to watch our on-demand shows. Now, Nima Barnett, tell me, what is it like? You've got a DC comic series coming. Yes. Uh, it's called Naomi. It's called Naomi, and it's created by Queen Ava DuVernay. Created ah, another queen. Yeah, oh yeah, she is the queen. <laughs> <laughs> um, she created uh, Naomi, and it's a, a, a DC comic from a DC comic um, comic book about a young teenage girl who is a superhero, and she's African American. Get down, get down, get down. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's coming on. Um, it starts January 11th. Mm -hmm. at nine o'clock, eight central, central time on the CW network. Great, great. And Casey plays Naomi, who's fabulous. She's a New Yorker mm -hmm. and she's just, just such a jewel and such a talent and such a wonderful young woman. And uh, she's going to give my granddaughter and all the other young black girls coming up something to look up to, someone to look up to, someone to relate to, which is what Ava does so well, you know, um, I was her producing director of season one of Queen Sugar, helping mm -hmm. you know get get the show off the ground on the first season, which wasn't easy. And so um, I got to work with Ava and see her power, and her talent, and her strength, and her love for her people. So this is her new series that's coming on, and we're all excited. She called me to to direct the episode, and there's no no to Ava. There's no no. <laughs> honored, honored, honored. So, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's going to be a great, great show. You know, um, it's important. You know, um, Naomi is important. Young Black female superheroes are important. You know, when I directed Raising Dion, mm -hmm. I got a lot of emails about how many young Black men and women love that show because of the little boy, Dion, who has superpowers, you know. So I'm living in a time where these shows are game changing, you know what I mean? Where our grandchildren will have uh, heroes to look up to who look like them. And like I told you in the beginning, if I hadn't seen Bennett Carroll when I was in high school performing arts, I would have never thought about directing. But seeing someone who looks like you, you know, gives you food for thought that yes, if they could do it, maybe I could do it. And that still holds true. You know, I mean, in, in your business and in my business, I mean, film, is a mind molding business, you know, mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. it's a mind molding art form, you know, it, it, it suggests how people look, how people dress subconsciously what they think. And I think for black folks, it's the final frontier, but we are out there and, you know, we're conquering that frontier on so many levels and it's exciting. Well, you, you mentioned Game Changer, so it's only appropriate that today, uh, 
we mentioned the fact that um, Sidney Poitier uh, has passed today, and he was a game changer. He changed the culture because of his being the uh, first African American to receive an Academy uh, Award uh, for 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 being a lead actor, and mm -hmm. uh, and he did so many socially important films. What would you? What are your thoughts about Sidney? Oh well, he's an icon. He's a legend, and he is. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a a warrior from day one. Um, I can't imagine what he went through. You know, I can I cannot imagine. Um, I know what I went through, so I can't even imagine what he, he went through and conquered it all. I mean, even movies like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and Lilies of the Field and, you know. Uh, call I, Me I, Mr. Tibbs. Call, call Me Mr. Tibbs and nobody to this day can still do it like Sidney. And how would you how would you have directed him in that scene where where he gets slapped and he slaps the guy back? I would have had him slap the guy harder. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and I could have got on some of my frustrations. I do that. <laughs> when I do these fight scenes with, you know, opposite, you know who I said, no, kick their ass. Go ahead, give it to him. Give it to him. That's enough for me. I said, okay, okay, that's enough. No, that's the only thing I would have given Mr. Portier. Just if you want to go harder, Mr. Portier, you can slap him a little harder. It's okay with me. <laughs> that's about it. But um, no, he um he left us with a legacy that we will carry forever and our grandchildren and the next generation will carry. And hopefully, you know, our young people will be able to look back and see what a powerful people we come from. And that's one of the reasons why my husband, Reed McCants, duh, and I do Black History Mini Docs, which are 90 second mini docs on Black history. We call it Cliff Notes for the Digital Age. Wow. And we've been doing it about eight years now. We do it because we want to give our people uh, knowledge of their past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working in, working all, all, all my life and, and running into people uh, who some who are not familiar with the strength that they potentially have, the power that they came from, thinking that, you know, everybody on the slave ships just jumped off and gave up. They have no sense of history, no sense of people who, you know, were lawyers, right? At, who became lawyers and doctors right after uh, they became free, you know, and, and struggle, uh, just, just no knowledge whatsoever. And so doing Black History Mini Docs gives us great pleasure. You know, um, we're over 1.4 million a day viewers. And we've got about, if you go to our Black History Mini Docs.com website, you could see like over 60 or 70 90 second mini docs. And every day we post. Uh, Beautiful. Uh, a poster, yeah, because it's important, you know, and Sidney Poitier, we've done many things on him, you know, we just posted today as well. Um, may he rest in power, G. Keith, you for know, sure, uh, sure, these, sure. these are people that open the doors for people like me, he and Max Julian, and, you know, it's just a, just every generation has its own warriors that come to, like I told you when I, when we first started this, people like you and Frankie Crocker, you know, kind of molded my youth, riding in my first car, my cool up and down Harlem, giving dances to Smoke's <laughs> Paradise with my two girlfriends, thinking we grown, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was great. And like I said, you know, my brother-in-law was Bob Slade. And, you know. The great had, Bob Slade. The great Bob Slade. Nobody and, could tell a story on radio like Bob Slade. No, they couldn't. And he had many Peabody Awards to show it to. That's so, right. you know, uh, mm, I don't want to get emotional, you know, but. So proud, honored when you called me to be on this show because I'm a proud Harlemite. You know, I'm not famous. Um, I don't. Uh, I do have a, a. I do have a hat that says Harlem, which I got the crew cool <laughs> show Harlem. But uh, I'm, not, I'm just one of the second or third generation of Harlemites who are regular people, born and raised and 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 bred, as Melba says, uh, born, bred, and buttered in Harlem who love our people in our community. And it is in transition. It you is. Know? And, and that's okay too, as long as they keep away from that feeling of entitlement, you know, that I can't stand. And we won't go into that, but um, it's okay because we're still standing strong and your show is so important Thank and you. you are so important. And uh, I, I guess at my age and where I am right now, I can afford to say no to a lot of things. And I've said no to a lot of radio shows.
that I didn't feel like being bothered with. But when you <laughs> called me, I was honored. You know, I was really honored. Well, I am so uh, thrilled that you took the time to uh, to come on the show because you know <clears throat> all of us. Uh, when I say all of us, meaning the, a lot of the folks listening, we've watched your work. We may not have known it was you doing mm -hmm. it, but we've watched your work. So we know the quality uh, of, of, of work. So we, we, we can give that, that, that honor to you for, for being the, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you, you're a directorial queen. Uh, <laughs> well, you know. thank you. Thank you, GK. There's so many talented Black women out here. But like I said, you know, to be a part of the Dwyer Center, which Cliff Frazier, you know, started, and, and the same person who started Third World Cinema, which I started in, and Community Film Workshop, where you started in, mm -hmm. um, to be a part of a community that you grew up in and still live in and can bring the public to. You know, bring the public to, like I told Tracy in Harlem, I said, I don't think too many people have seen, you know, some black girls late at night coming from a party, eating <laughs> sour pickles and potato chips, <laughs> on a stoop. you know, only people like us who are born and raised in Harlem know about these things, well, you know, right. um, and to be able to highlight the Schomburg uh, nationally, you know, uh, is, is uh, a gift and it's a blessing, you know, and so, Everybody now Harlem is in the limelight. Everybody, all all lights are on Harlem. That's right. But, and we're and we're connecting Harlem with the Harlems of the world. Yes, you are. And there are Harlems all over the world. You know, Crenshaw, you know, in Chicago and, 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 and a lot Atlanta. of Atlanta. Atlanta, Philadelphia, Baltimore. And Baltimore, you know. I know when I did Black Lightning, I would ask uh, uh, the executive producer, I said, How did you get this? How does this show stay on? stay on the air because it's so red, black, and green. And yeah. So many issues, I would think by now, you know, they're like, mm. but um, it's a new day, you know, and we have more people in control who could say yes, you mm -hmm. know, like Charles King, who has stay macro, who's producing so many good black movies out now and, and has, you know, and is a power player and, uh, you know, a lot of other people. So I just think that we do have a ways to go as far as image control goes. And I think that we have to stand up and speak up mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. see that it's not happening correctly. And I mean, you have to be willing to take the hit, you know? That's right, that's you know? right. In the long run, if you don't stand up, you're gonna regret it later. So it's, 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 a, it's a thing that I, I hope that more of us uh, start to do. You know, well, Nemo, th this has been really, really wonderful, and uh, I'm so happy for you and uh, you. you, you and Reed. Uh, but I got, I have to ask you uh, as we wind down here, we've got about maybe three minutes or so. Okay, what have you given up to become the Nima Barnett that we know today? What have I given up? Um, you know, G Keith, I don't think I've really given up anything because. The opportunities that were brought my way that I didn't feel were right, mm -hmm. I turned them down. Those opportunities could have made me famous, could have made me rich mm -hmm. um, if I would have just played the game that needed to be played in order to get it done the way they wanted to get it done. It's just like meeting with someone who says, I want you to do a movie about the Panthers. And this is how I wanted to go. But, um, sir, that's not how it went. You know, this is not Memorex. We're dealing with real lives here. <laughs> so if you're willing to do a make-believe playtime, you know, a uh, story about the Panthers or mm -hmm. the Godfather of Harlem where, you know, Adam Clayton Powell, I mean, he was a lazy man, but he was a wonderful, everyone loved him. I mean, he was so popular that some, and for many times, nobody ran against him. Right, right. You know, and Harlem Hospital stands today because of Adam Clayton Powell. So to portray, which is another show I turned down, to portray Adam Clayton Powell in a slimy kind of way or Malcolm X, you know, or a person like Bumpy Johnson, who was a numbers banker. He wasn't a drug dealer, you know, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. distortion of our history in cinema, you know, I, what can I say? You know, um, it wasn't my thing, you know, just wasn't my thing. And so I don't condemn anybody. Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do because... History is history, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, if you make them believe something's memorex and make believe, then it's fine. Use your imagination to do everything you can. 
But well, we, if you're talking about real people, and I wanted to tell you, I'm going to tell Tracy, ask Tracy if she could put you on Harlem for season two. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. That would be great. That would be great. Oh, that'd be Thank super great. Uh, a, a, a little plug for myself. Did, did, did you see my uh, part in The Intern with Robert De Niro? No, I didn't. Well, I, I'm, I have I'm to look there. at it. My God, I'm gonna put that on my list. I'm, I'm gonna find it as soon as I get off with you, GT. <laughs> well, great, I you great. To, I don't want you to forget how okay. very important you are to us. Thank you are you. so loved Thank and we you. support you so much. And we've loved you for many, many years. Regular people like me who you didn't even hardly know. You know, <laughs> you're a fan and you have many, many fans. So just keep doing what you're doing and know no matter what happens that we got you. And you Thank have you. Conversation. I appreciate that. And uh, uh, Nima Barnett, continued success with you. Uh, you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you've enjoyed our special guest today on What's Hot Harlem America with G. Keith Alexander. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And have a great day and a better one tomorrow, uh, unless you've made other plans. <laughs> I'm G. Keith Alexander. See you next week. Bye-bye.